29. Ten minutes later, Evie, Folier, and Unak stood outside Diamant's quarters. She'd sent his escort, Ensign Marrow, who had been stationed outside his door, back down to join the security team she'd arranged to meet them in Bay 1 at Diamant's shuttle. She tapped her calm. Cass, how is it looking down there? she asked. We think we've got them all. Breach gave us some frequencies to work with, and we think the two missing Bulak are on the underside of the ship, doing core knows what. But Zenfor says we can decompress that section, since those decks are shut down. The explosive blast should knock them off the ship. And if Diamant wants them, he can go get them after they get off the ship. Good. Prepare to initiate the force barriers on my mark, she said. Ready down here. Evie glanced at both security officers with her. They nodded in unison, their weapons ready in their hands. Here we go. Mark. Force barriers engaged, Cass said. There was a moment of silence on the other end. They should all be stationary, including Diamond. The deck was successfully decompressed, and the two should no longer be on the side of the ship. Let me know when you get confirmation of that, she replied. Until then, die is all out. She nodded for Unak to open the door. He entered the unlock code, and the door slid open to reveal Diamond sitting in the one chair of the room, a blue glow around him. Ah, Captain. How nice of you to come and visit. You could have knocked. He raised his hand, indicating the door. I would have let you in. I don't know what you think you're doing here, but it's over, she replied. His visage didn't break. Of course it is. I see now I never should have tried to best you. He glanced to the two security officers. So, what happens now, hmm? Am I to be shot? His eyes returned to the gun in her hand. No, you're leaving this ship, all of you, and you're not coming back. I see, he replied, too comfortable for Evie's liking. Then I suppose we best get on with it. May I stand? Or will this field cut off my head if I try? Evie tapped her calm. Drop the field in quarters IO-76. The blue field disappeared, but Folier and Unak kept their weapons trained on Diamond. He stood slowly. If those things pop out from your back, you can trust we will kill you. I have no further quarrel with you, Captain. He held up his hands in front of him. Evie smirked. It was possibly the one hand gesture their two species had in common. And I certainly don't wish you harm. You'll have no trouble from me. Somehow his words didn't make her feel better. She'd prefer it if he was fighting them. Or if he at least looked surprised. But he was neither. To Diamant, this was just another day with nothing out of the ordinary. It unnerved her. Let's go, she said indicating Higo first. Whatever you say, Captain. He inched his way forward and made sure not to touch any of them as he walked past. He didn't turn his back on them, but stopped at the door anyway, his hand still up. Turn around and start walking. Evie lowered her weapon. There was no need for all three of them to keep guns on him. That was just overkill. But she wasn't about to put it away. They exited into the corridor with Diamant in front and the three of them behind. I'm curious, Captain. What gave me away? Surely it couldn't have been my performance, he asked. She considered not answering him. Everything he said was some stretched version of the truth. First, you tell me what you're really doing here. Why did you want to get on the ship so badly? When the Choju Itza came from my planet, it wasn't on a mission of benevolence or mercy. They came to kill. No opportunity was given to my people. We were helpless against their attack, he sighed. I'm not sure an off-worlder could understand. You didn't watch your planet disintegrate before your eyes. You haven't been shunned and turned away by every other species in the quadrant. You live on this palace of a ship, and you dare question my motives? His face turned in fury. Folier and Unak raised their weapons again, keeping them locked on Diamond. I know the Chojuita aren't done with us, Captain. I know it in my heart. 
And because of that, we need to leave this place. We need to get away where they can never find us again. Your ship with your advanced engines is the only ship in existence which can outrun them. Surely you must see how valuable that is to us. He'd come from his anger, but Evie didn't tell the others to lower their weapons. Turn back around, she said through her teeth. Very well. But you're the one who asked, he replied, resuming his original posture. He straightened and walked forward, as if he were leading them instead of being escorted. How are you so sure they'll return? Evie asked after a few quiet minutes. Because they didn't stop with our planet, he replied. The Choju Itza didn't attack our stars until we had tried to fight back, until after we tried to stop them. We were doing nothing but defending ourselves. Evie screwed up her face. Wait, you're saying they destroyed your stars because you fought back? I witnessed it myself, Diamond replied, keeping his gaze ahead of them and walking at a consistent pace. I saw what few ships remained in the system attempt to fire on them. When they did, the Choju Ita became vindictive. They destroyed our stars, and as a result, all our settlements in the system, along with most of our stations and ships. Within hours, everything had been annihilated. I thought you had been knocked out before any of that happened. He turned, showing only the side of his face and a smirk. Caspian does make a thorough report. I will give him that. And here I thought he'd been so high in Ossack he wouldn't remember. He paused. I don't tell the true tale to many, as they might get the wrong idea. But no, I witnessed it all. I witnessed the destruction of my world, my stars, and most of my society. Those who were out of the system at the time, they were the lucky ones. Evie felt a growing discomfort in her stomach. She couldn't help but feel bad for them, and she knew they were desperate. But to try and steal their ship was unacceptable. If you'd been honest with us from the beginning, we might have been able to come to an agreement. Oh, come now, Captain. Don't tell me you'd have taken the time to ferry a bunch of nomads back and forth to a new home. It would have taken years. And from what I understand... You're on a schedule. We could have at least helped with the preparations, even helped you find a new planet, as you originally suggested. What was your eventual plan? Control of the ship? She caught Folier and Unak exchanged glances. Temporary control, he replied, and your resources. But we wouldn't have left you destitute. My people know all too well what that is like. It isn't something we could impose on another culture. We would have taken your ship back to the hub, filled it to the brim with my people, and begun our search for our new home. And then, once we were there and settled, we would have allowed you to leave. Simple, though time-consuming. She dropped her gaze. I wish we could have come to an understanding. I feel for your people. I really do but deception and subterfuge are not the ways to get what you want. I regret we had to resort to such barbaric practices, but my people are desperate. And now, because of you, we will only become more desperate. By removing me, you are diminishing our chances for survival. She shook her head. My original offer still stands. You can have the supplies and we will give you information to help you increase your food output on the hub, but nothing more. We just can't afford it. He clasped his hands in front of him. It's a very generous offer, Captain, but I'm afraid it is too late. The trust between our people was broken the minute you pointed those weapons at me. If I gave in now, I would be accused of playing into your hands, and people would revolt. I must keep the peace, no matter the size of the sacrifice. He stopped and turned around again. The security officers held their weapons to him. You should feel honored. It isn't often someone manages to get the drop on me. Will you tell me now what gave me away? We found more than one set of mandible tracks on the outside of the hull, she replied. 
His head flinched back. But how? Realization dawned on him. Of course. Regis' tracks are different than everyone else's. I should have anticipated that. He smiled and turned around again. You've caught me in a rare moment of weakness, Captain. I applaud you. No applause necessary. They were almost to the bay. She'd feel so much better once he was back on his own ship. Perhaps it would be a good idea to sedate all the Bulak before sending them back off. She should call Zax and get a medical team down here to administer it to each Bulak they collected. It would make the job much easier. Go ahead and take him inside, Evie told the two security officers. I'll be there in a minute. Yes, ma'am, Anson Folio replied, pushing Diamond forward. He still had a grin on his face Evie couldn't help but dislike. Despite everything, he was still toying with her. She glanced down to tap the calm of the back of her hand when something hard rammed into her, knocking her to the ground and the weapon from her hands. Chaos erupted. Thirty. I don't like it. Laura paced the width of engineering. Cass watched her as Zenfor continued to work on the engine systems behind him, as did the rest of the engineering crew. That bastard is still hiding something. I know it. Like what? Cass asked. He has Evie plus two other guards escorting him. What else is he going to do? Besides, Diamant doesn't come across to me like the kind of person who gets his hands dirty. If he were going to do something rash, he gets someone else to do it, and we have everyone else locked down. He, he, he's de deceptive, Reed said from the corner of the room. He'd backed into it and stood there, as if being smashed up against the walls was the only thing keeping his sanity. See? Even he agrees with me. Laura motioned to Reed. I'm calling her. I gotta know everything's okay. And what are you going to say? Cass asked. I'll mix something up about the weapon systems. She tapped the back of her hand. Captain, come in. There was nothing on the other end. Laura screwed up her face. Captain? Cass noticed an unease forming in his stomach, the kind that always came along when one of his courier missions was about to go south. He turned to Zenfor. Anything out of the ordinary on the sensor logs? I was just going over those. She glanced up to Sester, whose arm moved over to the primary sensor control units adjacent to him. He's worried, too. There are anomalies in the system. Evie, come in, Laura said into her calm. Maybe her concerns weren't misplaced after all. But how could Diamond have gotten the upper hand? She wasn't stupid, and she wouldn't have turned her back on him. Are the force barriers still holding? Cass asked. Senfor moved over to another monitor to check. Yes. They're all still in place, and most, if not all, the Bulak are still under guard by one or more security officers. Which meant the frequencies Reach had given them were accurate, and Diamant's people weren't still roaming the ship. So why did something feel wrong all of a sudden? Laura gave up and stared at him, her eyes accusing as if to say, I told you so. Okay, fine, let's go check, Cass said. Vreej, you come with us. I'm willing to bet you're better at hand-to-hand -hand combat with your people than we are. He nodded again. They, they would, would slice you, you to ribbons. Laura's eyes went wide. We need to go. Now. She ran over to one of the supply lockers in engineering and pulled out a pulse rifle. Cass instinctively reached for his sidearm, but it wasn't there. It was in the security lockup on level 12 near the bays. He should swing by and grab it just in case. Try and figure out what's going on, he told Zenfor. Calm us as soon as you have some information. She'd pulled up an image of Bay 1 where they were supposedly escorting Diamant. Everything looked normal as far as Cass could see, though Diamant and the escort hadn't arrived yet. What could be taking them so long? It wasn't that far of a trip. Are you coming, or am I doing this alone? Laura asked, already at the door to engineering. Cass and Reed jogged to catch up with her. He wasn't sure if it was Laura's insistence, or the fact that his mind had been somewhere else while they all waited in engineering, but the hairs on the back of his neck now stood straight up. 
He turned to Vreed. Can I count on you to help us? Vreed tapped his chest twice, though he was clearly nervous. For a moment, he thought about calling Box as well. The extra muscle wouldn't hurt. As he followed Laura down the long corridors, Cass tapped his calm. Yeah, boss, his friend said on the other end. Get down to Bay 1. I think we've got a problem here, he replied. Caspian problem or actual medical problem? A Bulak problem, he said, breathing hard as he picked up the pace. Laura was fast. Caspian problem, then. Shall I bring the bazooka or the grenade launcher? Just get down here. We're on our way. He ended the transmission. Grenade launcher. What had he been watching now? Wasn't Zack supposed to be keeping him too busy for net dramas? As they ran, Vreej's mandibles extended out and in front of him, almost like protective blades. Cass really didn't want this to get bloody, but as he studied the gleaming metal blades, he could see how they might easily slice a person in half. This could go bad fast. They took the nearest hypervator down two levels to twelve, but in their haste, Cass didn't even bother veering off toward the weapons lockup. It was too far away, and between Laura and Reed, he was confident they had enough weapons. When they arrived in Bay 1, it became clear to Cass that they had severely underestimated Diamant's cunning. Instead of a contingent of security officers waiting to escort Diamant to his shuttle, the bay was a wreck. A second Bulak ship had seemingly appeared out of nowhere and was perched in the middle of the deck, while at least forty men under Diamant's command subdued and restrained the bay crew and security officers. Cass noticed the adjacent bay, where the space wings and pilots were stationed, was blocked off by a force barrier, though it hadn't been one of the ones Zenfor had set up. And in the middle of the crew the Bulak had rounded up so far was Evie, on her knees, with her hands behind her head, while one of the Bulak bound her wrists together. "'Let her go, motherfucker,' Laura said with perfect calm in her voice. The pulse rifle was outstretched in front of her, and she took slow, calculating steps toward the group. Diamant turned with a smile on his face. He surveyed the three of them, though Vreej held back with Cass right behind him. Cass tapped his calm. Box, abort. We have borders, he whispered. Ah, Caspian, how good of you to join us, Diamant announced. You saved me an awful lot of trouble by delivering yourself to us. And there is no use calling for help, he turned to Laura, because... If you value the life of your captain, in his hand was Evie's gun, pointed right at her head, such crude weapons, perhaps we should demonstrate how we deal with unruly prisoners. Julid, if you don't mind. The Bulak standing behind crewman Abernathy smiled. Abernathy never saw it coming. One moment he was staring at Cass, his face drawn in confusion, and the next... His head had been severed clean from his body and was rolling across the floor, leaving a trail of slick blood in its wake. His body, which took a moment to register it was in the process of dying and remained upright for an almost comical amount of time, flopped over, blood pouring from the severed neck. "'You son of a bitch!' Laura growled behind the rifle. "'Now, you wouldn't want a similar fate to befall your captain, would you?' Already, one of the Bulaks stood behind Evie, despite Diamant pointing the weapon at her. Evie's face was one of fury. Just shoot the bastard already, she yelled. Cass was sure she was pissed at herself for letting him get the drop on her. Laura winced, then unshouldered the rifle, throwing it to the ground. Get away from her, she said, too much emotion in her voice. Cass was sure Diamant would take notice. Of course... Now that we all have an understanding. He passed the pistol off to one of his men. Cass couldn't stop staring at Abernathy's severed head, his surprised eyes bulging from their sockets. Now, Captain, we were in the middle of a negotiation, if I'm not mistaken. Three of the Bulak came over and restrained Laura, Cass, and Vreed, taking them to join the others. This isn't a negotiation. This is a hostage situation, Evie spat. You say comet, I say comete. In the end, does it really matter how we label our respective positions? Diamant smiled. What does he want? Cass asked as he was pushed to his knees and his hands bound behind him. Control of the ship, she replied. 
You will make a shipwide announcement, telling your people to surrender themselves willingly. Otherwise, one member of the crew will die every fifteen minutes until either they comply or we run out of people to execute, Diamant announced. If I were you, I would encourage them to cooperate. We will deposit you on the next planet we pass. You never had any interest in trading, did you? Your only goal was to get on the ship. Zenfor was right. You were behind the attacks. Diamant placed his right hand on his left cheek. You flatter me. It's true my influence does have a far reach. Who knows what others will do in my name? I control what a rogue faction of radicals does when they happen to see a vulnerable ship passing by. But there is one thing for sure. It's for the good of the Bulak people. We will be strong yet again. He turned to Evie. Now, would you like to make the announcement or witness the severing of your first officer here? He blinked, still smiling. Or perhaps your tactical officer. Take me to a comm panel, Evie said through her teeth. Cass glanced back at Laura, who had dropped her head. Hey, he whispered, it's not your fault. It doesn't matter what we would have done. They always had the upper hand. Yeah. She lifted her head enough so her eyes were barely visible under her drawn brows. And who let them on the ship in the first place? Cass turned back around and sat back on his legs. She was right. All of this was his fault. Evie never should have put him in charge. Damn it. And he knew better, too. It was too much to hope that the second time would be any different. Why? Why had he assumed he could do things any better this time around? Because it wasn't official? Because he didn't technically have a rank? Those things didn't matter in the slightest. Leadership came from character. And it was clear to Cass he'd never had the character to begin with. Otherwise, he never would have put his crew in this position. And now, unless Zenfor and Sester could figure out what was going on before it was too late, they would be removed from the ship and left for dead on some barren planet. Andromeda would find their way to the Coalition and destroy it, just as they had the Bulak, and there was nothing he could do about it, and it was all because of him. Thirty-one. Senfor stared at the feed coming in from engineering. The captain had just made a shipwide announcement informing the crew they were not to resist the Bulak and to do as they said. But Zenfor wasn't having it. Diazol wasn't in command of her. She was her own consul, and she would be until the day she died. And in the little time they still had before Bulak invaders flooded every corner of the ship, she had been trying to figure out how they had gotten past ship security. It doesn't matter. We need to prepare. Don't do anything rash. They're not taking me into custody, she muttered, going over the information on the screen. It looked like the Bulak had managed to break into the internal sensor data and put everything on loop. But they had done it with such skill, it was difficult to tell any changes had been made at all. If you fight them, you're putting the crew at risk. So what? They do nothing but lie and deceive each other. It's what they deserve, she replied. You don't believe that. I know you too well. You don't know me as well as you think. Weak elements must be purged. Everyone on this ship is a liability. What matters is getting the information back to Maless and the others. Her mind searched for any option. If she could reconfigure the same kind of probe they were going to use back at the XL Nebula and load it into a shuttle with an undercurrent, it would reach the Coalition. It might not be soon enough to make a difference, but it would at least get there. That was more than she could say for this ship. But did she have time to configure and launch one? Does that mean I'm a liability as well? She'd been so intent on working, she hadn't even realized what she'd said. She stopped and glanced up. Most of the crew in engineering had stopped working. Instead, they stood huddled in small groups, watching the doors precariously. All except for Tyler, who continued to work regardless. His face was centimeters from his screen. Whatever he was doing, it looked intense. No she replied, looking up at Sester. 
It doesn't include you. And you're right. It doesn't include the others. But you have to admit, things would be so much simpler if you all stopped lying to each other. The humans have had a hard time with it in the past. It was one of the failings of their old societies. We are working on it, but not hard enough, it seems. Consul, Tyler yelled, running over to them. I need your help. I'm trying to lock out the main computers so the Bulak can't use them, but I need a foreign encryption key. He glanced up to Sester. And I need your security clearance. Mine only goes so high. Will that work? Zenfor asked, glancing at the door. They couldn't be far now. I don't know. We have protocols for when ships are boarded. But with the amount of damage we've sustained, a lot of the backups are offline, including the security protocols. That's not from the damage, Zenfor said. The Bulak did that on purpose. We need to lock out what we can before it's too late. She had to admire Tyler. Despite everything, he wasn't giving up. While the rest of the crew had already stopped, anticipating what was on the horizon, he charged on. She felt as if she'd misjudged him before. The door to engineering rolled away, revealing a dozen Bulak, half with pulse rifles and the other half brandishing nothing other than their back mandibles. Zenfor had the immediate urge to rush them and begin tearing them limb from limb. No, we can't put the others in jeopardy. I know, I know, she muttered. She'd been too late. There hadn't been enough time to even load a probe with their data, much less launch it. She watched the Bulak spread out, taking each person individually. One with its mandibles out approached her and Tyler. You come with me. You, he pointed to Tyler, stay here. Zenfor flexed her fist. Just how hard were their skulls? Could they take the full impact from a sill fist? Especially one that had been trained using the ancient fighting technique, Kylocution? She really wanted to find out. Hands out, the Bulak said. She slowly extended her hands, fighting the urge to grab him by his tiny head and crush it. But instead, she allowed them to be bound together. She tested the magnetic lock between them and found it was stronger than she'd anticipated though she might still be able to break them in a pinch. Follow the rest, the Bulak said, indicating the rest of the engineering crew who had been rounded up. Only Tyler and Sester remained. The Bulak weren't stupid. They knew they needed both of them to use the undercurrent. Diamant had been busy since coming aboard. Zenfor followed the rest of the crew out into the corridor. Similar scenes were playing out across the deck, as coalition crews were led out of their respective rooms and down corridors until reaching the hypervators where they were escorted to places unknown. For all Zenfor knew, they were taking them all to the bays and kicking them out into open space. If that turned out to be the case, she'd take as many with them as she could. It turned out to be a short trip up one level to nine, where she and three of the other engineering crew were let out. Zenfor noticed one was Ensign Jackson, the same idiot who'd interrupted her goodbye ceremony with Moles. He was tense, cowering as they led him away. The two Bulak guarding them escorted them down the corridors until they reached the brig, which already had a few occupants, including the robot and the doctor. Another Bulak had already taken over the brig's control station, and he looked up when Zenfor and the engineers entered. Over here. He wants them all in one place, he said indicating Zenfor and the others file into the leftmost brig. It was a space built for one or two at the most, not four, and though they weren't cramped, it wouldn't be comfortable. Once they were inside, the Bulak raised the barriers. Zenfor noticed the cell beside her empty, but in the next cell over stood some of the bridge crew, Lieutenant Zal, Uma, and River, the navigator. She didn't see the helmsman. Just as the two Bulak who'd escorted them here left, the door opened again to reveal the captain, Caspian, Lieutenant Yamashita, and Reed all being escorted in where they were stored in the middle unit. Behind them was Diamant, a big smile on his face. There, he said. Isn't that more comfortable? The force barrier went up, sealing the four of them inside. They looked unharmed as far as Zenfor could tell. I expect you to keep your word, the captain said her eyes never leaving her captor. Captain, I'm insulted. Are you insinuating I might not be telling the truth? He asked, 
his mock sarcasm dripping. It made Zenfor want to rip his head from his body. No more of my crew has to die, Diamant. Promise me that. If they behave, everything will be fine, he replied. Despite what you might believe, I have no quarrel with you. You just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I am going to get what I need for my people, one way or the other. He surveyed all of them. If we have any problems, I know where I need to come and ask. Rest assured, the remainder of your crew will be waiting in your cargo areas under heavy guard. And your elite space fighters are safely contained in your other shuttle bay. As long as we have an understanding, there will be no problems. He clasped one hand over the other fist and bowed, then turned and left with the other Bulak. Only the one manning the control station remained. Yeah, and stay out, the robot yelled. Are you okay? Cass asked, staring at Zenfor. Fine. Were all your materials worth it? Stop. We're not going to bicker in here, Captain Dials all said. We're all in the same situation. We needed parts, and Cass found them. It just happened that he brought back some unwanted guests at the same time. She stared at the Bulak, who only smiled back with nothing but smarminess. Great. So now what do we do? Lieutenant Yamashita asked, slumping down on the small bench in her cell. We don't do anything, the captain replied. We can't risk harming the rest of the crew. We don't have much of a choice. Centaur turned in frustration, staring daggers at Jackson, who'd sat on the small bench in their cell. He saw her and jumped up, moving aside. She slumped down to the seat in his place, crossing her arms. Nothing like this would have ever happened on a sill ship. If it detected a person they didn't want aboard, that person was ejected into space. However, if the person required a trial, they would be kept, as Caspian was. But here there were no trials, only actions. It was so uncivilized. And it only made her miss home more. As Cass watched Zenfor sit in the other cell, he couldn't help but think about how he was the world's worst repeat customer. All of this could have been avoided if he hadn't been so adamant about finding the Bulak and helping them. He still found it hard to believe Diamat was just doing this for his people. Was this really the best way to go about trying to find more resources? Had they not come upon the Bulak, would Tempest's crew have resorted to similar tactics to get what they needed to survive? He supposed it made sense. Looking out for a new planet would give them a lot of opportunity. But how many planets could there be that didn't already have some kind of dominant species? In Cass's experience, if a planet was habitable, it had at least one occupant. Some planets had many, many more. He glanced over at Evie, who had the most dejected look on her face. He couldn't even imagine what was going on inside her head. But without asking, he knew it was because she blamed herself for this, for not being able to get out of it like Green might have. He hated he'd caused her to question her ability to lead this ship. All this was his fault, not hers. Hey, he said, standing beside her. He could feel Laura's eyes in the back of his neck, but he didn't care. Evie didn't say anything, only acknowledged him with a glance. So what's this awesome plan you have to get us out of this? Her eyes narrowed. What? I figured you had some mastermind plan you'd come up with in the past five minutes that would save the ship. You know, something easy? She dismissed it with a shake of her head. But there was a tiny smirk at the end of her lips. I don't know what to say. It was nice of you to defend me. But this really is my fault. I never should have brought them aboard without your authorization. I guess the first officer title doesn't exactly fit anymore. She eyed him. Why? Because you made a bad call? Didn't you ever make any bad calls working on the Hartford or the Atlas? Was every decision you made the perfect one? Because that's remarkable. He shook his head. You know that's not the case. She considered it. Maybe. But if you hadn't done what you did on the Atlas, you'd be dead along with the rest of the crew right now, right? And Rutledge would still be out there experimenting. Or trying to, at least. What are you saying? This is a blessing in disguise? She scoffed. No, absolutely not. 
I'm just saying we need to make the best of a bad situation, whatever that means. It was clear she was struggling to keep it together for the crew. There had to be something they could do. Cass glanced around the cells, then at the guard by the door. His eyes hadn't left them, and Cass wasn't sure how good his hearing was, but he didn't want to take any chances. Dejected, he took a seat beside Laura, but his eyes landed on Vreej's belt, and it all became clear. Thirty-two. Cass stood and turned his gaze to Box, who looked like he was scrawling something on the far side of his cell's wall. Cass cleared his throat, and Dr. Zax glanced up, but Box remained oblivious. Cass slid his eyes to the guard, who had taken an interest in something on the station's console. He nodded to Zax to get Box's attention, which she did by tapping him with two of her four hands. I'm drawing here. Box scrawled with the tips of his fingers. She hit him harder. What? he yelled, turning around. Can't you see I'm trying to design a more efficient sperm delivery system? See, this here is the flagella, and this is the poor stamen, and this goes into this like so. The guard perked up at the noise, his eyes now on Box. It wasn't what Cass had planned, but it would work. He tapped his calm. Ryant? Jan? Do you copy? he whispered. This is Ryant, the reply came through. Evie perked up. Remember you told me about that training run you guys did on Takar? I think it'd be a good idea to do that again. There was a pause on the other end. Are you serious? What about... Don't worry about the details. Just be precise. Very precise. Ryant coughed. Yeah, okay. Maybe twenty minutes. There's something we have to do first. My freedom of speech is being suppressed, Box yelled. I can draw whatever I like. Cass glanced up to see the guard had walked over to Box's cell and was yelling something at him, to which Box was yelling right back. Zack stood off to the side, her eyes sliding to Cass and a smirk on her face. He nodded in appreciation. Call when you're ready. Rebo out. He cut the calm. What was that about? Evie asked. We might not be sunk quite yet, Cass replied, but the margins will be razor thin. He turned to Vreed. Hand over your skin curtains. Do I even want to know what that is? Laura asked, leaning away. They're like our repel fields, only better, Cass said. Vreed unhooked three from his belt and passed them to Cass, Evie, and Laura. How many more of those do you have? Vreed counted. S seven. Cass glanced around the brig. It wasn't enough for everyone, even if Box and Zenfor could go without one for a short time. He only hoped Ryant was as good a shot as he thought he was. Shut up, or I'll come in there and disassemble you myself, the guard grunted at Box. I'd like to see you try. I'll break your hands in five places before you get one on me. I know the seven most deadly ways to kill a man, and half of them I can do without even looking. Come on in here, big boy. Come on, Box yelled. What's the matter? Can't back up your threats with any action? Don't want to try your pincher thingies against some real steel? Mandibles, Zack said. Try some mandibles against real steel? Box repeated. He'd come right up to the force barrier, and his eyes were blinking in wild patterns. Cass couldn't tell if it was all for show, or if he really did want to take on the guard. For all his bluster, the guard wasn't taking the bait. He merely bared his teeth, then returned to the control station. Jerk, Box said. You put me in a confined space, I'm going to draw in it. He returned to his erotic drawing. Cass turned his attention to Zax. How did they grab you so quickly? She shook her head. I'm not sure. A couple of them came in, threatening us just after the captain's announcement. This one had been prepared to needle them all in the necks, she indicated Box. I persuaded him it probably wasn't the best thing for the crew. Cass couldn't disagree. If Diamond had found out, he probably would have executed Evie. He turned to her, but she was watching him carefully, as was Laura and Reed. Even Zenfor had perked up. They still had some time, so he might as well gather as much information as possible. 
He focused his attention on the Bulak. Hey, guard! The man glanced up. Aren't you one of the ones that accompanied our shuttle back from the hub? The guard remained impassive. Cass took that as a yes. So you should have been restrained by a force barrier. How did you get free? A smile appeared on the man's face. You think we're so primitive, he replied, when actually we probably know this ship better than you do. Diamant planned for your contingency. We already had an easy way out. You disabled my program? Centaur asked. She'd stood and pushed through the others in her cell to come to the front. Leaving you any recourse would have been sloppy, the man replied. And just as predicted, you tried to restrain us. I guess it didn't work out too well for you. From the look on her face, Zenvor was furious. Cass wasn't sure Sil's skin turned red when they were angry, but it had gone from a light blue to a much deeper shade. He was glad she was behind the force barrier, otherwise he was sure she would rip the man apart. So they've been sneaking control this entire time, Evie said, more to herself than anyone else, and we didn't see it. We saw it. We just thought it was something else, Laura said. But Evie only shook her head. Cass placed his hand on her shoulder. Don't worry, he whispered. I think we have a plan. But I need you to do something first. The next person who speaks will be shot, the guard said, surveying the space wing pilot seated in a loose cluster on the floor of Bay 2. He'd heard Ryan speaking into his comm and threatened him with a pulse rifle he confiscated from one of the security officers. Darcy Ryan sat back with his hands up and mouth shut. All of his friends, his fellow pilots, his family, was in this one small confined space being held by a group of aliens who nearly killed him with their fucking Ossack drink. Zax had ended up needing to pump his stomach. He'd had a bad reaction to the substance and could have ended up critical had he continued to drink it. But he'd known the risks when he first took the bottle and now he was ready to get some justice. Only, what Cass suggested was suicide. How the hell was he supposed to get to his ship and launch from the bay without the Bulak killing everyone in sight first? Sure, there were twelve of them and only four Bulak, but they each had those razor-sharp knives on their backs, and Ryan was pretty sure those could cut through almost anything he could throw at them. He needed another way. He glanced over to Santorina, and catching her eye made a few hand signals in their shorthand. It was a backup system they used when they were out in the field if they lost comms, which was more common than one would think. Cass just called. He wants us to recreate the run on Takar. She glanced at the guards, who had gone back to watching the bay instead of the individual prisoners. Her forehead creased. Is he serious? She signed back. He shrugged. Assuming Cass and the others were in the brig, it would mean a delicate operation at best. Ryan flipped on his goggles, bringing up an interior map of Tempest. The brig was located deep in the ship, at least three horizontal decks in from the outer hall. They'd have to be amazingly precise. Any ideas? Jan shook her head. He wasn't going to give up, though. He told Cass twenty minutes, and he met it, even if he hadn't quite known how they were going to accomplish it at the time. Ryan stared at the end of the bay where the force barrier kept out the vacuum of space, and an idea dawned on him. It might be their only hope, but it would mean perfect coordination between all of the space wing pilots. Everyone needed to be aware and ready, otherwise they couldn't take the chance. He caught Saturina's eyes and nodded toward the opening. Her eyes went wide, and she shook her head. No other choice, he signed. She had a pained look on her face. Raffi's not going to like it. Does she ever? Start informing everyone. Saturina shook her head again, but tapped an eye off her own shoulder, informing him of the plan. Silently, he passed it along to Coley and Blackfield, and then on to C, Squires, Utley, and the rest, all of them glancing back at Ryan like he was crazy. But no one had outright opposed yet. Finally, Wilmoth made the signs, passing the word along to Linkovich and Raffenkel. Their leader turned to him and immediately shook her head no. There seemed to be a collective breath of relief from the other pilots, who had been willing but not confident about their chances with such a stunt. 
but Dorsey Ryan wasn't swayed. He was doing this one way or another, and they'd had fair warning. From where they sat on the ground, he began to inch backward, keeping an eye on all four guards who were positioned around the main doors to the bay and the adjacent doors to Bay 1, which was still cut off by the force barrier. Ryan was pretty sure he'd have to make a break for it, and he had no clue how fast the Bulak were. From what he'd seen in their city, most of them were on the edge of starving. But for whatever reason, these that had boarded the ship from the second shuttle seemed well-fed and healthy, which meant he couldn't take any unnecessary chances. With those powerful hind legs, they might be able to make huge leaps. He wouldn't know until it was probably too late. Raffenkel's eyes flared as he continued to scoot back. All the pilots were watching him now, with the exception of Jan, who had begun her own movement toward her space wing. Ryan glanced behind him. The end of the bay was a good hundred meters away. He flexed his legs. He could probably do it in fifteen to twenty seconds if he pushed it. All that time at the gym hadn't been for nothing. He nodded to the pilots, holding up his hands and extending all ten fingers twice. That's all the time they'd have. Raffenkel mouthed, no, but he turned around anyway and got into a crouching position. Hey, what are you... Before the guard could finish his sentence, Ryan took off like a shot, bolting down the bay toward the open end. Hey, he's running, the guard yelled. There was chaos behind him. People were yelling. There were scuffles, the sounds of metal clanking against metal. But Ryan paid no attention. His entire focus was on the small panel at the end of the bay. Out of his left ear, he heard one of the space wings start up. Then another. Then a scream. He couldn't bear to think about who it had been, or the thump-thump of heavy footsteps behind him gaining. He was so close. He skidded to a stop right at the panel before something heavy and solid ran into him, knocking them both over as they hit the force barrier at the end of the bay. Beyond, there was nothing but empty space, but Ryan's focus was on the Bulak who chased him down. His sword-like mandibles were out and already coming around to slice into him when Ryan sucker-punched the Bulak, sending his head back and a spray of maroon blood flying from the alien's nose. He winced, and the mandible stopped, his focus on his face. Ryan punched him again before he had the chance to recover, and the man fell off to the side in serious pain. A lot tougher than you thought, huh? He stood and entered the code that would drop the force barrier, exposing the entire bay to open space. You can't, the Bulak said and one of his mandibles freed itself from under him, coming up and impaling Ryan through the back. He glanced down to see the mandible hadn't gone all the way through, but he felt the warm rush of blood spill from his back. Surprisingly, there wasn't a lot of pain. Either it was the adrenaline, or getting stabbed didn't feel much worse than being punched. It wasn't enough to stop him, that was for sure. He hit the final sequence, and a moment later, everything in the bay was sucked into space. 33. He's close, Evie whispered. Her eyes closed, and her mind focused on what was happening on the ship. Cass had told her to reach out to Sester, as he was the only one who could keep the ship out of the undercurrent now. Because once the ship jumped to faster than light speed, his plan wouldn't work anymore. They needed to do everything they could to keep the ship in one place, at least for a little while. How close? Cass asked. She shook her head. She couldn't see exactly as she could feel. She'd never been further than a few meters from Sester when they'd gone to the mine place. But now she was a full deck and several hundred meters away. She wasn't even sure she was connecting with him, but she could almost feel what he was feeling. Evie felt a reassuring hand on her back. You can do it, sweetheart. I know you can. Laura. Sweet, sweet Laura. Evie had put her through so much already, and yet she had stayed strong beside her. How could she have ever thought she'd get mad over something as simple as coming home late for dinner? Just focus, Evie nodded. She could do this. Shit, Cass whispered. The guard is looking over here. Keep working on it. She sensed he'd left her side while Laura continued to rub her back supportively. Hey, Cass yelled. I have a medical condition. I need to see my doctor. He's over there in that cell. That's right, 
Fox yelled back, turning from his drawing. I'm his doctor. I've got everything that ails him. I need to administer medicine. I'm not stupid, the guard replied. You're just going to have to suffer. Boss, it looks like he doesn't believe you, Fox said, goading the guard. It was difficult for Evie to concentrate. Don't worry about what they're doing, Laura said. Just focus on Sester. Nothing else matters. Her hand slipped from Evie's back and took hold of her hand instead. Evie smiled, but kept her eyes closed. Laura was wrong. This mattered. She took a deep breath, filtering out the obscenities Box was now hurling at the guard. All her thoughts were focused on Sester and his physical position on the ship. She could do this. She just had to concentrate. Slowly, the world around her seemed to melt away, and Evie opened her eyes to find herself back on Sisk, standing in the middle of the desert. A lone figure stood a few meters away, turning to reveal himself to be Sester in his human form. Captain? he asked, frowning. How? Did you bring us here? She surveyed the area. I guess I did. I focused really hard. But that's not important now. We need you to keep Diamond from initiating the engines. That won't be easy. He's had all his people down here working on repairing our issues. The Bulak are fast and efficient. I would dare say our engines have never worked so well. Zenfor might even be able to get her drive back up and running. Sester, do everything you can to keep the ship in one place. If we move, everything is lost. Is Diamant there now? He shook his head. No, he's on the bridge. But there are others here in his place. I can sabotage the engines, but they'll know it was me. They might take it on on Lieutenant Tyler. I think that's a risk we'll have to take, she replied. Hopefully they realize they need Tyler as much as they need you. We'll be as fast as we can. I promise we won't leave you there alone with them. He considered it a moment. Very well. I trust you, Captain. She smiled. Thank you. The scene dissolved around her, and she was back in the cell, Laura still gripping her hand, while a cacophony of consonants and vowels flew through the air with fury. My pet Rulak had a face like yours. I'd shave its ass and teach it to walk backward, Box yelled. You're nothing but a niffle-eating cumberbunch. Box, I think he's got it, Cass said. Evie turned to see Box back at the edge of his cell, his yellow eyes blinking like wild as the insults flew from his mouth. The guard wasn't having it, though it was distracting him from Evie's cell. Cass turned back around. Good? She nodded. Then I'd say we're about ready. He turned to Vreed. How do we use these things? Vreed pointed to the top of the small canister. Hold down on the top, and it takes care of the rest. Fifteen minutes supply of oxygen. Hopefully we won't need that much, Cass said, palming the device back into his pocket. He checked his comm for the signal, then shook his head. Evie really hoped everything was okay in the bay. She hadn't been happy about this plan, but they were out of options, and Cass said Ryan was confident he could make it work. She'd gotten in contact with Sester, so now all that was left to do was wait. She glanced at Laura and gave her hand a squeeze, grateful they were in this together. Here, Cass said. The comm at the back of his hand blinked. That's the signal. Activate them now. Evie let go of Laura's hand and fished the small canister from her pocket. She held the top and at once felt a strange shudder up her back. She didn't feel much different, though when she reached out to touch Laura, her fingers stopped just millimeters from her shoulder. B better hold on to s something, Reed said. Evie nodded grabbing one end of the bench in the brig. She glanced over to Zenfor, who stood at the edge of her own cell, with her arms crossed and her attention focused on them. This was either going to work great, or they'd all be dead in the next minute. There was really no way to tell. Just as Evie saw the guard notice they had all taken strange positions in the cell, the back wall exploded in what should have been a blast that would have killed them all. But instead of blowing into the cell, the wall itself and the concussive energy was sucked backward along with all the air in the cell itself. An alarm blared in the brig as Evie and the others were jerked toward the hole. Vreed lost his grip, 
but his mandibles extended, holding him on the plating as the air was completely emptied from the room. She checked the rest of them. Everyone seemed unharmed. She turned to see Box yelling something, but couldn't hear a thing anymore. She tapped her personal comm. Okay, let's go, she said. The other three nodded, and they all floated through the hole into the next section of the ship. Behind them, lights continued to flash, but Evie knew the guard wouldn't drop the field. That small amount of magnetic separation was the only thing keeping him alive, though he'd surely be making a call to Diamant. The three corridors separating the brig and the outer hull of the ship had been expertly blown away, creating a tunnel they could travel through. Evie hadn't been worried about anyone in those sections, because all the crew were in the cargo holds, and thus anyone unlucky enough to be in those sections when the space wings blew into them would have been Bulak. As she grabbed a charred piece of bulkhead to pull herself forward, she didn't feel an ounce of pity for them. Not any more. They reached the outer hall to find at least eight, if not more, of the space wings attacking Tempest herself. Riot! Riot, come in! Cass yelled into his comm. One of the space wings flew alongside the opening. It was Captain Yan's ship. He's been injured, she replied. I got him back into Bay 2 and repressurized it, but he's going to need medical attention, fast. Shit. Zax and the rest of the medical personnel were still locked up in the brig. They'd have to move fast to regain control of the ship. Just keep them occupied, Captain, Evie said. We'll take care of the rest. And good work. She turned to them as a space wing peeled off to re-engage the fight. If Tempest's weapons weren't at full capacity yet, they soon would be. And if the Bulak fixed the auto-targeting, they wouldn't last long out there. How do we get back inside the ship? Easiest way will be to go into that breach on Seven, Cass said, pointing up. Then we're only one level above the bridge. She nodded. And how do we keep from floating off into nothingness? As if to drive home her point, the ship shook with a blast from a space wing. Hang on to, to me, Vreej said. I can, can get you th there. His mandibles extended from his back, punching small holes into the bulkheads around him. Cass reached out and took his hand. Laura took Cass's, and Evie took Laura's, forming a chain. Vreej's mandibles walked around the edge of the bulkhead to where they were outside of the ship. He moved quick, each puncture a measured step designed to cover the most ground with the smallest amount of effort. The ship shook again, but Reed held down without a problem, headed for the open section on Seven. It had been a long time since he'd been on a spacewalk, and then it had been in a full enviro suit, nothing like this. She'd never felt like she could reach out and touch the stars before. The mine had blown out a series of eleven separate crew quarters on this level, and even now it was easy to see the remnants of what hadn't been sucked into space when the mine hit. A few tables and other personal items which had been magnetized or bolted down still remained, but otherwise everything else was gone, including some of the walls separating quarters from each other. Evie could barely stand to look at it. Vreej brought them into the relative safety of what little overhang remained as they approached one of the doors that would open to the outer corridor. But it wouldn't open without a security override, and they could still be offline. Evie could only pray the Bulak were thorough, that if their real goal was to take this ship, they wanted it operating in perfect condition, which meant fixing every broken system. If they hadn't, she wasn't sure what they would do. Armor's up, Cass said, glancing back. Evie followed his gaze to see he was right. The space wings weren't having as much success anymore. Many of them had pulled away to get out of the line of fire. Evie could see Jan's ship was still heavily engaged in battle. Just get us inside. The best thing we can do to help them is to get to the bridge and retake control, Evie replied. Cass hovered over the control unit to the door, tapping in his override code. The door slid open, but a blast of air knocked them all back. Had they not been holding onto Vreej, they would have been blown out into space. Vreej grimacing pulled them with both hands and, using the mechanical mandibles, shot forward through the blast of air until they were on the other side. Once inside, he clamped down to the wall and floor bulkheads as they tumbled back toward the opening. Cass reached over and shut the doors, closing off the suction. As soon as they were closed, the four of them collapsed against the walls. You, you can d d deactivate your c curtains now, Breach said, sitting up. His mandibles had folded back behind him. I think I'm going to throw up, Laura said. Let's not do that again. 
Come on, Evie said. We need to put an end to this. Thirty-four. The entire time they ran through the corridors, all Cass could think about was Ryan down in Bay 2. How bad had he been injured? And was it too late? He needed to find a way to get a medical team down there, though there were probably a dozen Bulak between them and the bays. Here, Evie said, after they'd run a long length of corridor, coming to the door to her quarters. It opened upon sensing her personal pattern, and she brought them inside. Cass was surprised they hadn't run into any Bulak yet, though they were probably trying to figure out what had happened to them after leaving the brig. As soon as they got eyes on the outside of the ship, they'd see Regis' marks leading them right to level seven. They didn't have a lot of time. There were two guns in the locker under my bed, she said, heading for the closet. Laura ran over and pulled the case out, unlocking it and withdrawing two standard coalition pistols. I didn't think weapons were allowed in personal quarters, she said, smirking. Being the captain has privileges, Evie replied, removing her sword from its mount on the wall. She ran a cloth across its blade, then sheathed it and slung the strap securely over her shoulder. Laura handed one weapon to Cass, keeping the other for herself. I assume you don't need one, she said to Vrige. He touched his forehead with two fingers, then shook his head. He was getting better at coalition hand signals. So what's the plan? We make our way to the bridge, remove Diamant from power, retake the ship, Evie said. And we need to get someone down to Bay 2 to check on Riot, Cass said. Laura checked her weapon. I'll take care of Riot. You three get to the bridge. Wait, Evie said. Why you? Because it's going to take all of you to take on Diamant. He won't be expecting both of you at once, and you can get the drop on him. And plus, if things go bad, you'll compromise your decisions if I get in trouble. She's got you there, Cass replied. Evie sighed. You're right. You are a distraction. She winked at Laura. Just be careful getting down to Bay 2. Don't take any unnecessary chances. And keep an eye out for the Bulak. You saw what they did to poor Abernathy. Laura stuck the pistol into her waistband. Got it. Don't worry about me. She pushed up on her tiptoes and kissed Evie's cheek, then disappeared through Evie's door. Evie took a moment to reset herself. Okay, let's get moving toward the bridge. We should avoid the hypervaders. And the large corridors. Cass turned to Vreed. You okay to go? We'll need you as backup. I am happy to help, Vreed replied. Quite the change from someone who wanted to borrow all our parts only a few days ago. Cass said, regarding him. His eyes fell to the floor, as if in shame. Not all of us think as Diamant. There are other ways to get what you need. You've been more than f fair. We'll talk about that later, Evie said. Right now, we have a job to do. Everyone be on guard. We have no idea where all the Bulak are, or when we'll run into them. Yeah, and apparently they can climb on the ceiling. So don't forget to look up every now and again, Cass said. A crease formed in Evie's brow. Really? Vreej nodded. The motion smoother than Cass had ever seen it. Okay, then. Let's move. The journey to the bridge was unsettlingly quiet, and Cass couldn't figure out why. He suspected by now the Bulag knew they had survived the explosion and were on the ship somewhere but they hadn't seen or heard any of Diamant's crew since leaving Evie's room. She kept her sword sheathed, but remained alert, managing to find one of the access corridors close to the stern of the deck. That had led them down one floor to eight, and then back over into an adjacent access corridor next to standard hallways that would eventually take them to the bridge. Evie thought it was better to stay out of sight as long as possible, despite the halls being empty. Though he couldn't disagree, Cass wasn't sure if the lack of people was a good thing or not. On one hand, it could indicate Diamant was short-handed and didn't have enough soldiers to keep every area under surveillance. But on the other, it might signal he was expecting them and prepared to spring a trap. It was impossible to know until they got there. Here, Evie said, crouching low as not to hit her head. This junction connects to one more that will take us right beside the conference room off the bridge. 
Breach? When we arrive, can you use your mandibles to cut through the bulkhead to give us access? He nodded, a smile on his face. He was happy to help, and Cass couldn't blame him. After everything Diamond and his people had put the man through, Cass would want to see revenge at almost any cost as well. And he'd want to take part in that revenge as much as possible. Okay, moving on. Stay low, stay quiet, and cut through that bulkhead as quickly and with as little noise as you can. She picked up the pace through the cramped access tunnel before turning a corner and then turning one more. She stopped, pointing at the wall. She then crawled further along while Reed squeezed past Cass. He hadn't been close enough to tell before, but the man had a clinical smell to him, like antiseptic. Cass wasn't sure if it was his natural pheromones or it was something artificial he'd added himself. Regardless, Cass held his breath. The scissor-like mandibles extended out from Reed's back, cutting into the bulkhead beside him, creating an opening just large enough for them to crawl through. Once he was done, he backed out of the way to allow Evie to step through first. She checked both sides before disappearing through the hole. Cass followed, with Reed right behind him. The conference room was in the same condition as always. There was little, if anything, out of place. Okay, Evie whispered. We'll have to make this quick. Cass, you go in and get the jump on as many as you can. Hopefully, he doesn't have a lot of crew up here. Whoever you can't cover, Vrij, I need you to detain. I'll come in behind you and take Diamond. Cass glanced at her sword. You mean you're going to stab him? Whatever it takes, she said her eyebrows drawn so low he could barely see her eyes. He took my ship and killed Abernathy. He's not getting away with it. He had his chance to leave. That doesn't square with the Coalition Charter. She withdrew her sword. A lot of things don't. Cass hadn't realized just how upset she'd been at this whole situation. He couldn't exactly fault her for feeling betrayed and used, though. Diamant had played all of them. And while Cass was fed up, he wasn't to the point of killing the man. But maybe she was right. Maybe this was what it took. Maybe they all had to adapt. Ready? she asked. He and Vrij nodded. Go. Pistol in hand, Cass charged through the door connecting the conference room to the bridge. His first impression was he'd done exactly what he'd meant to, catching everyone on the other side off guard. But then he saw Diamant with his own pulse pistol in his hand, aiming it right at Cass's chest. Almost as if his brain predicted something else, Cass saw the pulse shoot from Diamant's pistol in slow motion, his brain telling him this wasn't how it was supposed to go, that he was supposed to be the one shooting them, and his eyes were deceiving him. The blast from Diamant's pulse pistol hit him square in the sternum the pain causing him to collapse behind the specialist's console as the world sped back up. Cass hit the ground, holding the wound with one hand while still gripping the pistol with his other. The pain was intense, debilitating. He wasn't even sure how much longer he'd survive. He'd never been shot in the chest before. I'm afraid your efforts are in vain, Caspian, though I applaud you for escaping from your own brig. I've been doing some reading and understand you've had some history with prisons. Having your people blow a hole through three corridors just to get you out was inspired. There was laughter in his voice. Cass could see the edge of Regis' silhouette on the other side of the still-open door, and he shook his head. Before he'd fallen, he'd seen only two other Bulak on the bridge, one at the helm position and the other at tactical, probably coordinating the fight against the Space Wings, Evie had been right. Diamant was short-handed. It was an even match-up. Or at least it had been before Cass had stupidly gotten himself shot. He adjusted himself, and with a great deal of pain, peered around the side of the console itself. He might still be able to take down one of the other two, even if he couldn't get Diamant himself. How do you know? Cass said, breathless. The person at Tactical had his own pulse pistol as well, and though he was holding it, his attention was focused on keeping the ship safe. I'll tell you what. A tale for a tale. I tell you how I knew, and you tell me how to get the engines back online, Diamant replied. 
I guess it's good to know you don't know everything, Cass replied. Honestly relieved his plan had worked. I don't need to know everything, only the things that matter. Like I know you're not alone, but your friends are smart enough to stay out of my line of fire, he replied. If he knew Evie and Reed were with him, he must be using a modified internal sensor. Could they have had time to repair all those systems already? Fridge said they were good, but it was hard to imagine they were that good. Then again, Diamant had told him the ship would be ready in a matter of days. Perhaps it was possible. Cass exhaled a deep, ragged breath. The pain was only getting worse. If Diamant had set the pistol on its highest setting, he'd already be dead. But that didn't mean the end result wouldn't be the same. He needed medical attention immediately. So, what's the plan? I stay here, and we sling insults at each other until one of us runs out of breath? Because it seems like I don't have much time left. Caspian, you are entertaining. No, if you decide not to tell me, I'll wait until you are a corpse, and then I will just torture one of your compatriots on the other side of that door for the information. Unless you decide to tell me now, and I'll allow them to live. I'll never forget how guilty you felt over what happened to Susanna. Surely you wouldn't allow that to happen again. His heart thrummed in his ears, and he couldn't think straight. The pain from the blast and the pain of his past conjoined, forming one giant ball of living, writhing fury rising up from him. He needed to kill Diamant, and the sooner the better. He pointed his pistol around the edge of the station and fired wildly, not caring if he hit anything or not. He didn't have a good line to any of the occupied stations, and to his surprise, Diamant had disappeared. When he pulled back from the corner, Diamant was suddenly there and grabbed his head with both hands while his outstretched mandible knocked Cass's weapon from his hand. Cass was so focused on the intense pressure against his skull he suddenly didn't care about anything else except getting free. Hurts, doesn't it? I'm slowly applying an increasing amount of force to whatever is inside that soft skull of yours. The claws at the end of his hands dug into Cass's skin, but only enough to cause you a massive amount of discomfort. He leaned in close. The real discomfort will come as you watch your friends suffer and die by my hands. And don't think I won't do it. After all, he whispered, if I'm willing to kill my own people, there's no telling what I'm capable of. 35. Evie stared at Reege, all her focus on him. Because he'd been ahead of her, she hadn't seen what had happened at the bridge as soon as Cass went in. And now the doors had closed again, cutting them off from whatever was happening over there. What happened? she whispered. Diamond, he... he sh shot... he shot Cass? Breege nodded. No. He'd been ready for them, which meant he knew she and Breege were here as well. Was he still alive? Y yes but hurt. Breege dropped his gaze. That sealed it. She was going in. She couldn't allow Diamond to harm Cass any further. She gripped the hilt of her sword with both hands, focusing on it intently. She hadn't used it since Jatan. There had been a part of her that thought she'd never use it again. But she'd come to realize the sword was a part of her, and she wasn't going to discard part of her history because it was uncomfortable. She was going to embrace it. She drew a deep breath and calmed her senses, standing close to the door. Follow me if you can. I'll need all the help I can get. She took one last breath and stepped forward, the door sliding open as she approached. In front of her, Diamant held Cass by the head, and they both turned to look at her as soon as she came through. Evie raised the sword above her head and brought it down at an angle, meaning to slice right through Diamant. Instead, he pushed Cass away, the force allowing him to dodge the sword as he twirled in place and produced a pistol from somewhere she didn't see. Evie ducked to the side, keeping the sword low as she dodged back and forth in a zigzag pattern. Diamant fired twice, 
both shots missing her as she moved around him in an unpredictable pattern, only hoping to get back within striking range. Look out, Cass yelled, as another Bulak at tactical aimed his own weapon at her. She crouched low and rolled away behind the bridge engineering station, coming to a stop. Most impressive, Captain. Had I known you were an accomplished swordswoman, I would have been better prepared, Diamant said from somewhere near the front of the room. As it is, I suggest you give yourself up. Your first officer has severe wounds and may not survive much longer. I promise to give him medical attention if you tell me what is wrong with the ship's engines. Adrenaline surged through her system. How badly had Cass been shot? And could she afford to wait around to find out? But what if it was another lie? Evie peered around the side of her cover to see Vreed come barreling through the door and running into the Bulak at tactical, his mandibles fully extended. They disappeared behind the station, and the only sounds were metal hitting something hard and the tearing and ripping of flesh. She couldn't imagine what they were doing to each other. I must say, I never would have expected it. Meek Vreej attacking a Bulak soldier head on. Very brave. Stupid, but brave, Diamant said. Time is wasting, Captain. I need your answer. Tell him to <coughs> go to hell, Cass coughed from somewhere off to her left. He must have crawled behind the specialist station for cover. Did he still have his weapon? A weapon blast permeated the air, and Evie glanced around again to see Diamant at the far end of the room with a smile on his face and the weapon outstretched. She could just make out Cass across from her behind the other station. She gripped the sword tighter. I suggest you make your decision quickly, Captain. You and I may have all the time in the world, but poor Caspian does not. She, she doesn't need to make a d decision, Breed said standing from behind the tactical station. He was covered in cuts and wounds, as well as a generous amount of maroon blood, but his face was set. Diamant's visage cracked for just an instant as he realized Vrij had been the victor against the other Bulak. He turned his weapon on Vrij, but didn't fire. You are n not our savior. You are nothing more than a weak m man who m makes others do the hard work. Diamant's face twisted into a smiling sneer. Now, Vreed, why would you say such a thing about your old friend? We, we are n not friends. Vreed stood his ground with his mechanical mandibles extended. The one had been shorn off halfway along its length. The other Bulak hadn't gone down without a fight. You, you won't kill anyone w w with that. D -d Don't forget... I kn knew you before all this, and under all your de deceptions, you're just, just a s scared little boy. Without flinching, Diamant placed the end of the pistol to the head of the Bulak who was in control of the helm and fired. The man didn't even have a chance to register what had happened before he slumped over in his seat, dead. Evie was too shocked to move. What did you say about not doing the hard work? Diamant asked. The problem, Vreed, is you don't know your old friend as well as you thought. Evie kept her eyes on Diamant. He had the gun trained on Vreed again. You weren't there. You didn't see those monsters destroy everything we held dear. And when it was over and I realized I had survived, I made sure I would never find myself in a compromised position again. Vreed took two steps forward and Evie thought she saw Diamant's hand shake slightly. His mandibles were still folded behind his back. I'm n not afraid of you, Reed said. N not anymore. You should be. As I told the late Caspian over there, I am willing to do anything to ensure the survival of our people, even if it meant killing a few in my way, starting with the crew of my ship. Didn't. I couldn't very well put myself in a position of influence if someone of higher rank than me survived, could I? he asked. The question being the first genuine thing Evie thought she'd ever heard from him. History is written by the survivors, and that's what I am. It's what you are. We can make it like old times again. 
Help me, and we'll both be hailed as heroes of our people. You're not a hero, and neither am I, Breach said. Evie noted, stutter-free. Diamant's eyes went wide, and Evie saw her chance. She rounded the station out of cover and kept the sword low, only swinging it as she rushed into Diamant's personal space. He leaned back, the blade only catching the pistol, slicing it clean in half and taking two of Diamant's fingers with it. He screeched in pain as his mandibles unfolded from his back and began to parry Evie's attacks as she tried to cut into him. Breach joined on the other side, but with only one mandible, its effectiveness was halved. Even at two against one, they were evenly matched, as Diamant fought with both his bloody fists and his natural blades. The moves were hard and hurried. Evie would strike as hard as she could, but Diamant's mandible would block the hit, knocking the sword away as the mandible moved to strike her. It was like sword fighting with two different people, because as his mandibles blocked the main hits, his hands, with their sharp claws, scratched and reached for her and Vrij, sometimes clipping them as they fought. In her periphery, Evie tried to see Cass, to make sure he was still alive, but she couldn't see him behind the station. She only hoped he could hold on a few more minutes. But her distraction caused her to miss a strike from Diamant, which sliced into her abdomen, producing a rush of warm blood over her uniform. She winced, but didn't withdraw. Instead, fighting harder to get a good blow in, she only needed one. Cass could feel his body shutting down. It was a strange sensation, feeling the life drain from his limbs. But he wasn't down for the count yet. He could still make this work. His pistol lay just a few meters away. He gathered all the strength he could, hoisting himself up on his knees. His chest burned like fire, and everything tingled. There was no telling how much longer he had. He was barely conscious enough to see Evie and Vreach fighting off Diamant at the front of the bridge in a flurry of blows. He wasn't sure they could beat him, which meant there was only one other recourse. With great difficulty, he tapped the calm at the back of his hand. Gian, he said breathless, "'You still out there?' "'Everything's good out here,' The ship has stopped firing, she yelled. I need you to do it one more time, Cass said. Do what? The Takar maneuver, on the bridge. You can't be serious, she replied. But he was. It was clear Vreej and Evie wouldn't last much longer. And they both still had their canisters Vreej had handed out. They could survive in space for a few minutes. Diamant couldn't. I'm dropping the armor now. Target the front of the bridge, right at the view screen, he replied, his words weak. Are you okay? she asked. Fine, just... just do it, he replied. Cass crawled to the tactical station, every part of him hurting as he moved. He just managed to pull himself up and disarm the ship's armor. Clear, he said. Diamant grunted as he was hit with an onslaught of blows, but Cass was too tired to care. He was too tired for everything. All he wanted was to sleep. He couldn't believe this was how it was going to end. After everything. With what little strength he had left, he pushed himself fully upright, feeling as though he would pass out any second, though he didn't. Use, use your canisters, he yelled, with as much force as he could. He noticed Evie catch his eye. She ducked and rolled away from Diamant's mandibles, and Cass noticed she left a sizable trail of blood in her wake. Once she was out of range, she shoved her sword into the floor, holding its hilt as she reached into her pocket. There was a massive explosion at the front of the room, and for a second Cass thought Jan had miscalculated and destroyed the bridge and all of them with it. But then the main viewer disappeared into the darkness of space, and the dead Bulak at the helm followed it, along with anything that wasn't secured down on the bridge. Vreej managed to dig his one mandible in the floor and hold on, as did Evie, her head down and grip on the end of the sword. Diamant had also shoved his mandibles into the ground and had managed to resist being pulled away, though the force of air ripping through the space was intense. Cass, having expected it, had lowered himself down behind tactical so that he wouldn't be pulled away. 
but he'd activated the skin curtain in his pocket, just in case. Surveying the scene, it was clear Diamant wasn't going anywhere unless he did something. Wrenching himself around the console was harder than he anticipated, especially since all the strength had left him. Somehow he managed to pull himself around and felt the harsh pull of decompression yanking him toward oblivion. All he had to do was line himself up and release. As he flew toward the opening, his body barely on the ground, he pivoted just enough to miss Vrij and slam into Diamant's surprised face, grabbing him as the force knocked them both through the opening into open space. Once all sound had left him, Cass pushed Diamant away, watching the man tumble along with the same inertia, Tempest growing small in the background. This was okay with Cass. He'd gotten Diamant off the ship, and he disabled it so the Bulak couldn't use it. Without their leader and no ship to capture, the crew would be able to retake Tempest for themselves. Cass could barely keep his eyes open. Things were a lot colder than they'd been the first time he used the skin curtain, and he found it difficult to breathe. He glanced over to Diamant, who wore a triumphant smile on his face. In his hand, he held a canister that looked exactly like the one Vreed had given him. Cass's heart fell as he felt the hole in his pocket. Diamant had stolen it off him. Diamant said something, but Cass couldn't hear anything. The silence permeated everything around him, and he could feel the actual crystals forming on his skin. It seemed the cold would kill him before Diamant could stab him with those mandibles. He cursed himself for not being able to do more. Diamant exploded in a mess of blood and guts right in front of him, some of the matter splashing up against him as it flew out in all directions. Cass turned to see one of Tempest's shuttles approaching, flanked by two space wings. Exhausted, Cass finally closed his eyes as the shuttle grew closer and closer. The danger was over. Thirty-six. Won't hurt him. I just want to take some samples while I can. How often is he in here? Cass cracked his eyes open, allowing the light of sickbay to come in a little at a time. He wasn't sure where he'd just been, but Box's voice had pulled him out of it. Unless he signed a formal release for his genetic material, you can't just harvest it from him, Sachs replied. Cass glanced over to see her and Box standing near the foot of his bed, arguing. But I'm his emergency contact, and when he's incapacitated, under coalition medical guidelines, I have the authority. That's not how it works. You only have the authority when a life or death decision needs to be made, not when you want material for your experiments, she shot back. Cass let out a breath, causing Box to turn to him. Great, now he's awake. He came to the side of the bed and leaned over Cass. Do I have your permission to remove 10% of your sperm? I'm working on a project. Cass flinched. What? No. What happened? Box threw his hands up in the air, walking away. I'm never going to get this thing off the ground. Captain Desikbe, Zack said, then smiled at Cass. How do you feel? I'm not sure. What's going on? He remembered everything, but his body felt strange. Like either it wasn't all there, or it wasn't all his. He felt like a stranger in his own body. You suffered severe trauma, but we managed to bring you back for a while longer. Hope you don't mind, she said, humor in her voice. My body feels weird, he said, flexing his fingers and toes to make sure they were all still there. That's because about 20% of it is new, she replied. We had to regrow and replace one of your lungs and your spleen and remove the parts of your skin that were either burned beyond recognition or frostbitten from exposure. You're lucky to be alive. Cass sat up, alert, and the room spun. Whoa there, Zack said. He put his head down until the spinning stopped. What about Evie? Are the Bulak? The doors to sickbay slid open, 
to reveal Evie walking toward him with a smile on her face. Thank goodness, she said. It was close there for a while. What? Cass asked, his voice rising. Sax gave him a reassuring smile. No, everything was fine. You're fine. She turned to the captain. We don't need to increase his anxiety. He's fine. Right, Evie said, stumbling for a moment. You're looking good. Are you okay? He asked. She lifted her left arm, massaging her abdomen. Just a puncture. Nothing Zax couldn't fix for me. I did that one, Box called from across the room. Evie smirked. Right. Box did that one. And Ryant? Is he... Lost a lot of blood. But Lieutenant Yamashita and the others reached him in time. He's fine. He's already back to work in Bay 2, Zax replied. Evie either saw Cass's confused look or decided to explain anyway. Instead of heading straight for Bay 2, Laura returned to the brig first, taking out the guard and releasing the prisoners there. She and Zenfor fought their way down to the bays, where Zax took care of Ryant, and Box commandeered a shuttle to come find you. I figured you'd try something stupid, he yelled from across the room. He pulled me out? Cass asked. Evie nodded. And Jan was the one who took care of our Diamant problem. He snatched the skin curtain right off you. Queasiness bubbled up in Cass's stomach. Can we please not call it that? He swallowed, making sure it wasn't coming back up. How could he do that? Oh, Evie said, her face turning pink. Breach told us the membranes of the curtains can be penetrated with something sharp enough. I think you can figure out the rest. Cass might have figured that out if he'd had his wits about him. But he'd been on the verge of unconsciousness, so a lot of things may have escaped his notice. Still, none of it would have changed his decision. What about the rest of the Bulak? Restrained, loaded back on their ship, and hauled to the middle of space by one of the shuttles, we weren't taking any chances. But with Diamant gone, the fight seemed to go out of them. Is everyone else okay? She nodded. For the most part. Her demeanor darkened. But we need to talk as soon as you're well enough. There's a lot to fill you in on. She turned to Zax. When? Another few hours. I want to make sure all the new organs have integrated without rejection, and everything is functioning as normal. Human bodies react differently to unconscious and conscious states. Evie turned back to him. As soon as you're cleared, meet me in my quarters. The bridge is under repair. Cass nodded, noting he didn't hear any blame in her voice for what happened to the bridge, despite he'd been the one who made the order. Her eyes lingered on him a moment, and then she was gone again. So, Box said, approaching, now that you know I've saved your life, I think you owe me a little favor. He held a syringe with a small bottle attached to the other end, Spread them. Zenfor stood at the doors to engineering, debating whether to enter or not. She was strangely nervous to face him again after everything that had happened. She hadn't been back since when the Bulak had come and escorted them to the brig. She had been so full of emotions then, going off about how terrible the coalition was and how everyone on the ship deserved what they got when in reality she was frustrated with her own performance or her inability to execute. She hadn't seen the Bulak modify the sensors so they couldn't be seen taking the captain hostage. She hadn't been able to set up a backup system to take them down when they took over the ship. She was a failure, and she didn't want to face the one person on the ship whose opinion actually mattered to her. She'd never been one to back down from her failures before, but those had been different. This was something more. She felt like she'd let him down. And that was a difficult position for her to stand in. Taking a deep breath, Zenfor walked back into engineering, ignoring the rest of the crew. She didn't care what they thought, and they could watch and gawk at her or not. All her attention was focused on Sester. She reached his massive cradle and stared up at him, trying to decide how to begin. But before she could begin... The world melted away around her, and she found herself back on the plains of Thislea, 
even though it wasn't quite the same. Night stretched above her in an endless sky, and the purple-tinged horizon betrayed no city lights or civilization. Sester stood in front of her, smiling. I was wondering when you would show up, he said. It's been difficult, she replied. I don't handle failure well. What failure? That you didn't see a coup coming? I saw it coming. I just thought I'd be able to stop it before it could get anywhere. But I've been distracted lately. I think it's affected my performance. He didn't ask the obvious question, because he already knew. It wasn't like it was a secret between them or anyone else. Their minds had already connected on an intimate level. But it hadn't been like the other couplings she'd experienced before. I wanted to thank you, Sester said, pulling her from her thoughts, for telling me about the Coalition's dealings regarding the Atlas. Had you never told me, I might not ever have known what the humans did. And while I don't agree with why they kept the information from me, I understand why the Captain and Caspian didn't tell me. I only did what was right, she said, still angry over the situation. The humans don't deserve your pity. Not after what they've done. But they do. Their species is still young. And they need our guidance and our help. We must be patient with them, as parents are patient with children. They'll learn one day, and then our futures will truly flourish. She scoffed. You give them too much credit. Maybe. But not all humans are alike. And I feel we must evaluate each other on their own merit. Because of your actions, my relationships with many of the humans on this ship have already improved. I have you to thank for that. Zenvor smiled. For what it's worth, you're welcome. I can't tell you how grateful I am to have a kindred spirit on this ship with me. I agree, he replied. There was a moment of silence where they just stared into each other's eyes. Even though Zenfor knew she wasn't really looking at his physical form, she felt as if this was his true self, his astral self, as it were, and that was good enough for her. Did the captain speak to you about her plan yet? Anticipation and dread arose in her, both in equal amounts. She did. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. She couldn't say she was disappointed necessarily, but it seemed like an extreme measure, at least for the time being. But things on the ship were dire, and if they didn't do something drastic, none of them might survive. I'm on board, Zenfor replied, as long as we do it together. Thirty-seven. Cass tapped the small button beside Evie's door. Zax had discharged him not more than twenty minutes prior, and he'd taken a short detour to grab fresh clothes from his quarters. When he made his way over to this side of the ship, he couldn't help but think about Reed leaving them across the hull of the ship. He'd never experienced anything quite like it. Come in. The doors slid open to reveal Evie at her desk, her sword back on the wall behind her. It looked pristine as ever. Feeling okay? she asked, looking up. He still felt weird. Even walking around knowing he had new organs inside him was enough to make his new skin tingle. It was almost as if all his body wasn't his anymore. But he clamped down the feelings. Fine. What's the emergency? He took the seat across from her. The ship is in bad shape. And even though we have all the materials we need to repair her, the repairs are going to take some time. A long time. And we've only got about a week of life support left. What? Cass asked, almost shooting up out of his seat. She shook her head. When Diamond and his men were repairing the ship, they also built in a couple of fail-safes. One blew the entire life support system to hell. Zenfor and Sester are working on it, but it's going to take longer to repair than we have. What about the shuttles? Isolating part of the ship off? Something? She held up her hands. We've already been over all that. We can keep minimal life support running for a while, but not for the entire crew. We're going to have to set down somewhere until we can make repairs. You mean land the ship? 
I don't think... No. I mean, we need to find a planet where we can take refuge as we send repair crews back and forth to fix the ship. He slumped back at his chair. Great. So we've become Diamant after all. I don't see another way around it, she replied. And even though we've gotten rid of them for now, there's nothing saying they won't regroup and come at us again. If there is one thing I know, it's that behind every maniacal leader, there is someone ready to take his place. So our first priority is moving the ship. I just don't understand how they were so many steps ahead of us the entire time, Cass replied. Breach told me it has something to do with the way his people can determine intention. It extends beyond their own species. But someone has to be trained to recognize it for what it is, and not just one's own mind talking to itself. I'm willing to bet Diamant was an expert, and he read us as easily as someone could read a book, knowing what we wanted and how we wanted to get it. She stood, walking over to the small table underneath her sword. I think he found out about our ship and orchestrated the whole thing. Cass frowned. Is Reed? He's requested to stay, but I wanted your opinion. He's an excellent builder. He could help with the repair efforts. As long as he doesn't share his old friend's desires. Apparently, they've been friends since childhood. Is that why he refused to shoot him? She shook her head. I don't know. Maybe there was a decent person in there once, but circumstances changed him and pushed him too far. I don't want that to happen to us. It won't. Diamant was alone. Our crew is united in this endeavor. No more lies and no more secrets. Cass watched her carefully. She had been under a lot of pressure lately, and it was his job as first officer to determine if the captain was still fit to command. He smirked. It had been the first time he'd thought of himself as a first officer in an official capacity. I just don't know. In the meantime, the engine should be up and running for a short undercurrent jump. I've had the shuttles out searching the area for something we can use, and we found a planet a few light years away, one we hadn't charted before. Inhabited? Cass asked. I'm not sure yet. Probably. But maybe we can barter for some space temporarily. Breach told me this area is full of a variety of species. Cass leaned forward, placing his forearms on her desk. Evie, what are we going to do about Andromeda? They're still out there, and they're headed for Earth, and we have no way to get back to the Coalition. She sighed. I know. I think our only hope is to fix the long-range communicator and send them what we have. Not that it's much. Depending on what Zenfor can do with the engines, we might still be stuck out here for a while. And if they're still on the same course they were on when we left Cypaxia, they're due to reach the edge of Coalition space in just under 80 days. We can't beat them back without Zenfor's enhancements, to say nothing of developing an effective countermeasure against their time-shifting. What do you think they want, really? She turned back to him, taking her seat again. I honestly don't know. But if it's anything like what they wanted from the Bulak, the Coalition is in big trouble. They could destroy all the inner systems in a matter of seasons, if that's their goal. If not, I don't have a clue what they could be thinking, she paused. But that isn't our primary concern at the moment. It's my responsibility to protect this crew, so that's what I'm going to do. We need to get to the planet, set up a base camp of some kind, and then begin repairs on the ship. Then we'll worry about Andromeda. She was right. Any earlier reservations he had about helping Evie lead this crew had vanished. It didn't matter that he didn't have an official rank anymore, and that he was acting in the capacity without the authority of the Coalition. Diamond had had the full support of his people, and he had been crazed, almost to the point where it was dangerous to his own kind. It hadn't mattered that he was once a great military leader. It was his actions that defined him. And it had taken Cass seeing the man for who he truly was before realizing he'd already gained the crew's respect and admiration. And he wasn't going to do anything to jeopardize that now. Cass nodded. Sounds like a plan to me. Evie walked into engineering to find Cass, Zenfor, and Box all there. 
while Vreed stood off to the side near the corner. Sester was in his cradle, operating the various systems that had propelled them into the undercurrent. He'd warned Evie it might damage the ship further, but if they stayed out in open space, things would only get worse. At least inside a system, they could harvest energy from the star using the energy collector and would have a place for refuge while Tempest was repaired. She didn't think it was an order Green would have made. And while once that might have frightened her, today it only gave her more resolve. This was the right decision. And just because it wasn't one he would have made didn't make it wrong or dangerous. She was going to get the ship out of the situation, no matter what it took. Where are we? she asked, tightening the loop on the sheath strapped to her back. She'd begun taking her sword with her everywhere over the past few days. Not because she felt paranoid or like she needed it for protection, but because this was a new era and that was what she decided to do. And if when they got back to the Coalition and someone wanted to report her for carrying a deadly weapon around the ship, then that's just what they'd have to do. To her, this was more important. Just dropping out of the undercurrent, Cass said, staring at one of the screens near the Master Systems display in engineering. With the bridge out of commission, it had become the ship's temporary command center. Hey, Laura whispered, indicating Evie over to the side of engineering. She smirked and went over to her. Have I told you how much I'm liking this? Laura ran her hand down the strap across Evie's front. Makes you look badass. I am badass, Evie replied, not hiding the smile on her own face. I know. Now everyone else knows it, too. If we meet anyone down there, they'll think twice before tangling with you. Laura reached up, placing a lingering kiss on Evie's lips that promised more in the future. I am so proud of you. Thanks, Evie whispered back, her heart suddenly fluttering. Hey, females, Box yelled, breaking the moment. Do you want to see this planet or not? Evie smirked and rolled her eyes as they both walked over to the primary monitor. I can't wait to get back on solid ground for a while. It's been years. You were just on that asteroid a few seasons ago, Laura said. That doesn't count. Asteroids are like planet larvae. They want to be planets someday, and maybe they will. Or maybe they'll just be swallowed up by the next gas giant they run into. Ignore him, Cass said. He's expanded his studies to include the entire biological spectrum now. Did you know, Box began, that a larva is often adapted to completely different environments than their fully grown adult forms? Yes, Box, everyone already knew that, Cass said, exasperated. Well, excuse the hell out of me. I'm just trying to raise the collective. Shut up, Zenfor replied. We're here. She indicated the screen before them. At first, Evie thought she was hallucinating. But as she moved closer to the image, and it didn't change, all of a sudden, her heart started beating rapidly. Evie? Sweetie? What's wrong? What is it? Laura asked, taking her arm. The room had become deathly still. She glanced up at Sester. Had he recognized it as well? What's going on? Cass asked. The planet, Evie said when she'd found her breath. It's the same one I've seen in my visions. It's the same one with the creatures. What creatures? She stared him right in the eye. Andromeda. This has been Secrets Past, Infinity's End, Book 5, by Eric Warren. Narrated by Larry Gorman. Copyright 2019 by Eric Warren. Production Copyright 2020 by Eric Warren.